Hello, my name is Zdzisław Koczarski. I am PhD candidate of the Institute of Polish Language, Polish Academy of Sciences. I would like to present the subject of the early knowledge of Petrarch's works in medieval Poland. Please enjoy. Jan Długosz was one of the most prominent historians in Polish Middle Ages. His contemporary, unknown biographer, praised his literary skills and achievements in the work titled Vita Lugosi. On the other hand, later historians and editors, from the half of 16th till the end of 19th century, did not share this opinion and criticized Długosz for plain, medieval style of his works and the roughness of his language. Nonetheless, modern scholars have proven how inaccurate and unjust were those accusations, and today they address him as the real father of Polish historiography. This drastic change came from deep investigation of Długosz language and literary sources. Indeed, Długosz read and profusely exploited a ton of classic authors, but further part of quoted description is wrong. Scholars have found a considerable amount of references and quotations from Italian humanists of Trecento and Quattrocento, which shifted character of Długo's creation closer to humanism and changed our understanding of his literacy. But the influence of works of Italian humanists was broader than many scholars thought. Even most prominent of them had not found yet the literary connections between Polish historian and Francesco Petrarca considered as the precursor of humanism. From the time of studies of Maria Kowalczyk, who has found marginal notes and signs of Długoś in manuscript BJ 444, comprising Petrarch's Rerum Familiarium Libri, known also as Epistole Familiares, only one more scholar has found hidden quotation from it in the Długoś hagiographic work, Vita Sancti Stanislai. Our article, therefore, tries to introduce the issue of the presence and usage of hidden quotations from Petrarch works in the Annales Długosz Opus Magni. We will present consequently the outcome of it, manners of exploiting those quotations, and the importance of this discovery for the question of literacy of Jan Długosz. We prepared application for the comparative analysis, which automatically simplifies works orthography to enhance the precision of analysis, and divides text into n-grams, sequences of n words. You can see the examples in the presentation. Then, we used application to reiterate these steps with the corpus of Petrarch, taken from the digital repository interbooks.eu. Finally, we compared n-grams from every text in corpus with analysis and received files with results, n-grams common for both texts. We were carefully looked through in search of the most likely community basing on their length, rarity in Latin language corpus, the most probationary one was the corpus corporum, and variety of other restrictions, for example, co-occurrence in classic literature or Bible. The outcome of this comparison was the list of 84 quotations from five Petrarch's works. As far as the presence of Epistole Familiaris on this list was ensured, or at least highly expected, other finds were surprising. For some of them, we did not even know that they were known in medieval Poland. Our further studies have shown that one of the manuscripts with the Remedis Utriusque Fortune from Jagiellonian Library has the actual marginal notes and signs of Jan Długosz, which corresponds with the found quotations. We could not find the manuscripts of the Viris Illustribus, Epistole Sine Nomine, Posteritati, and the first part of Epistole Familiares, used by Długosz in his work. However, regarding the limits of this article, we shall now leave these codicological deliberations and proceed to philological analysis of the Polish historian's manner of quoting and exploiting the works of Petrarch in Annales. Annales Jan Długosz Opus Magnum is the one of the biggest chronicle in whole Eastern European medieval historiography. It was produced nearly 25 years and describes the history of Poland from the legendary times, before the Christianization of Poland, till the last days of Długosz's life. The historical matter is embraced in the first 10 books, while the books 11 and 12 present latter decades, two great conflicts with Teutonic order during the second one, 13 years war. Długosz was performing duty of royal envoy and negotiator on peace treaty, and other important events of those times. Hussite Wars, 
Ottoman threat, etc. Still, the Poland and its history is the main axis of this work. Historians' sources included own observations and memories of his entourage, documents, as the notary of Cardinal Zbigniew Oleśnicki, and then the king's counselor and the teacher of royal hair. He had the remarkably easy access to diplomata and state and episcopal letters, older Polish chronicles, and works presenting universal history. The main goal of Długosz was to present Polish history in the prism of universal history and to depict exemplar from it, both eminent and shameful ones. The quotations from Petrarch were, are dispersed equally throughout the chronicle. We can find them in the historical part as well as in the contemporary one. They appear in every layer of chronicle due to long process of redacting the annales. First redaction of the chronicle was later complemented by many insertions from Długosz factual and literary sources. Finally, passages with accessing additional content were exchanged with revised and written folios or single pages. We can see this method thanks to perfectly preserved autograph of annales. We can see there also correspondence of the quotations and redactions. For example, the first redaction overflows with quotations from Epistole Familiares, which Długosz acquired early as the inheritance from the Polish professor Mikołaj Kozłowski in 1443. Historian read this codex very closely. Evidence of that for roughness is constituted by 536 manicules and 26 marginal notes written by himself in the manuscript. Many of these mnemotechnic signs, evidently left during few consequent readings, refer to engrams found by our application. One particular passage provides the additional evidence of this careful reading of Epistole. Długosz narrates the argument between Duke Mieszko III and his lieges and the tenor of bishops get cooperation addressed to the ruler. Story and the speech are taken from the older Polish chronicle, Kronika Polonorum of Vincenti Kadłube. But Długosz, according to his style, rewrites it and expands it. His narration is the element of the first redaction, but there are also some additions from the second one. The main text is written by one of his scriptors and the marginal supplements are written by Długosz himself. Some sequences from it were denoted by our application. For example, please look on the presentation. The most conspicuous issue here is the length and the accuracy of these quotations. Historian takes long word sequences from Petrarch's text almost literally, often maintaining the original white context of it. Subsequently, he used them as the frame of whole utterance, enclosing it and expanding with corresponding elements. He adds synonymous adjectives or even subordinate clauses, which enriches the locutionary force of the oration. Quoted sentence can also constitute a core of the uterus, which in this case is expanded with initial expression and closed by quasi-biblical thought on the justice of God. In the similar manner work shorter phrases, equally willingly used by Dugos. They function as parenthetical commentary or predicated opening for the subordinate clause. As for the accuracy, we can observe that historians often split quote sequences or commingle their word order. He exchanges sometimes single words with exploited phrases for the more suitable ones in the specific situation. Superbiam for avariciam, Jerusalem for polonorum res publica. He changes also grammatical forms, vacandum sit for vacca. Thanks to those means, he creates sentences that fit well in the context of the story and have no sign of original authorship. Analyzed quotations show us the literary skills of Jan Długos and his hard work on analysis. His narration uses the best Latin prose of Petrarch, but the most of it is the element of second, revised redaction. Initially, he has just rewritten the story found in Kadłubek's Chronica, but afterwards he has decided to enrich it with the adapted phrases from Epistole. Nonetheless, we cannot say that he did not use humanist's letter before changes. Examples first and fifth show us that during work on the first version of the story of Duke's and Bishop's argument, he used short engrams. They are from different books of Petrarch's work, so historian surely has read it all before writing analysis. 
It concurs with the information about getting the manuscript in the year 1443. Preceding considerations leave us with the important question. Why longer phrases originate from the one particular book of the epistole? Both story and letters deal with the similar topics of authority and politics, but is it the only matter? There are two possible answers. First, Dugos could just read again this part of Petrarch's work during adjustments of Chronicle, so he intercepted suitable and stylistically exquisite word sequences and adapted them in the narration. Alternatively, he could have prepared those quotations much earlier, during one of the careful readings, and denoted them in some form of catalogue or registry. The arguments for this could be the enormous amount of manipules written throughout the manuscript, and the profoundness of modifications in original word sequences. It looks like they were carefully considered and polished, which could not be achieved during direct work with manuscript. This so-called catalog hypothesis had some followers inter Polish scholars, but still there is not enough evidence to prove it. Therefore, we leave this question pending. Analyzed passage of Annales show us interesting thing about Długosz and his style. He reads his sources very carefully and masterfully exploits the fragments in his work. He makes the necessary alterations in order not only to fit the quoted word sequences in the narration well, but also to grant them some homely coloring. There is no single trace of the original authorship, but we can be sure that well-educated reader was able to find these details at glance. This trait of the Chronicle portrays Polish historian as a really good writer, deeply engaged in the humanistic trends. This leads us to the final question. Is Jan Długosz just the medieval chronicler or one of the first Polish humanists? Author of Vita Lugosi is sure that he avoided humanistic works, but prior discoveries of his contemporary sources and our analysis show us something totally different. Even the quoting manner is far from medieval scholastic system, where reference to authority of quoted author was all important. Therefore, we have to admit that Jan Długosz was at least proto-humanist, who was aware of the importance of exquisite style and up to date with the latest European intellectual trends, but also was in lack of time for final humanistic adjustments of his massive work. Many thanks for your attention.